Carthage, Punic, Cart Hadast, New City. Latin, Carthago, Arabic, Kraj Carthage was the center or capital city of the ancient Carthaginian civilization, on the eastern side of the Lake of Tunis in what is now the Tunis Governorate in Tunisia. The city developed from a Phoenician colony into the capital of an empire dominating the Mediterranean during the first millennium BC. The legendary Queen Dido is regarded as the founder of the city, though her historicity has been questioned. According to accounts by Timaeus of Tauromenium, she purchased from a local tribe the amount of land that could be covered by an oxhide. Cutting the skin into strips, she laid out her claim and founded an empire that would become, through the Punic Wars, the only existential threat to the Roman Empire until the coming of the Vandals several centuries later. The ancient city was destroyed by the Roman Republic in the Third Punic War in 146 BC and then redeveloped as Roman Carthage, which became the major city of the Roman Empire in the province of Africa. The Roman city was again occupied by the Muslim conquest of the Maghreb in 698. The site remained uninhabited, the regional power shifting to the Medina of Tunis in the medieval period, until the early 20th century, when it began to develop into a coastal suburb of Tunis, incorporated as Carthage Municipality in 1919. The archaeological site was first surveyed in 1830, by Danish consul Christian Tuxen Falb. Excavations were performed in the second half of the 19th century by Charles Ernest Bule and by Alfred Louis de Latre. The Carthage National Museum was founded in 1875 by Cardinal Charles Levigerie. Excavations performed by French archaeologists in the 1920s first attracted an extraordinary amount of attention because of the evidence they produced for child sacrifice. Although there has been considerable disagreement among scholars concerning whether or not child sacrifice was practiced by ancient Carthage, recent research indicates that child sacrifice was in practice. The open-air Carthage Paleo-Christian Museum has exhibits excavated under the auspices of UNESCO from 1975 to 1984. Topic. Name The name Carthage, Car Theta D, is the early modern anglicization of French Carthage slash Ka dot ta, from Latin Carthago and Carthago cf. Greek Carthadon Carchadon and Etruscan asterisk Car Theta Aza from the Punic Qrthd new city, implying it was a new tire. The Latin adjective Punicus, meaning Phoenician, is reflected in English in some borrowings from Latin, notably the Punic Wars and the Punic language. The modern standard Arabic form Kraj is an adoption of French Carthage, replacing an older local toponym reported as Cartagena that directly continued the Latin name. Topography Carthage was built on a promontory with sea inlets to the north and the south. The city's location made it master of the Mediterranean's maritime trade. All ships crossing the sea had to pass between Sicily and the coast of Tunisia, where Carthage was built, affording it great power and influence. Two large, artificial harbours were built within the city, one for harbouring the city's massive navy of 220 warships and the other for mercantile trade. A walled tower overlooked both harbours. The city had massive walls, 37 kilometres 23 miles in length, longer than the walls of comparable cities. Most of the walls were located on the shore, thus could be less impressive, as Carthaginian control of the sea made attack from that direction difficult. The 4.0 to 4.8 kilometers (2.5 to 3 miles) of wall on the isthmus to the west were truly massive and were never penetrated. The city had a huge necropolis or burial ground, religious area, market places, council house, towers, and a theater, and was divided into four equally sized residential areas with the same layout. Roughly in the middle of the city stood a high citadel called the Burza. Carthage was one of the largest cities of the Hellenistic period and was among the largest cities in pre-industrial history. Whereas by AD 14, Rome had at least 750,000 inhabitants and in the following century may have reached 1 million, the cities of Alexandria and Antioch numbered only a few hundred thousand or less. According to the not always reliable history of Herodian, Carthage rivaled Alexandria for second place in the Roman Empire. 
On top of Burza Hill, the location of the Roman Forum, a residential area from the last century of existence early 2nd century BCE, of the Punic city was excavated by the French archaeologist Serge Lancel. The neighborhood, with its houses, shops, and private spaces, is significant for what it reveals about daily life there over 2,100 years ago. The remains have been preserved under embankments, the substructures of the later Roman Forum, whose foundation piles dot the district. The housing blocks are separated by a grid of straight streets about 6 meters 20 feet wide, with a roadway consisting of clay, in situ stairs compensate for the slope of the hill. Construction of this type presupposes organization and political will, and has inspired the name of the neighborhood, Hannibal District, referring to the legendary Punic general or Sufe consul at the beginning of the 2nd century BCE. The habitat is typical, even stereotypical. The street was often used as a storefront, shopfront, cisterns were installed in basements to collect water for domestic use, and a long corridor on the right side of each residence led to a courtyard containing a sump, around which various other elements may be found. In some places, the ground is covered with mosaics called punica pavement, sometimes using a characteristic red mortar. The merchant harbour at Carthage was developed, after settlement of the nearby Punic town of Utica. Eventually the surrounding countryside was brought into the orbit of the Punic urban centers, first commercially, then politically. Direct management over cultivation of neighboring lands by Punic owners followed. A 28-volume work on agriculture written in Punic by Mago, a retired army general c. 300, was translated into Latin and later into Greek. The original and both translations have been lost, however, some of Mago's text has survived in other Latin works. Olive trees e.g., grafting, fruit trees pomegranate, almond, fig, date palm, viniculture, bees, cattle, sheep, poultry, implements, and farm management were among the ancient topics which Mago discussed. As well, Mago addresses the winemaker's art here a type of sherry, in Punic farming society, according to Mago, the small estate owners were the chief producers. They were, two modern historians write, not absent landlords. Rather, the likely reader of Mago was the master of a relatively modest estate, from which, by great personal exertion, he extracted the maximum yield." Mago counseled the rural landowner, for the sake of their own utilitarian interests, to treat carefully and well their managers and farm workers, or their overseers and slaves. Yet elsewhere these writers suggest that rural land ownership provided also a new power base among the city's nobility, for those resident in their country villas. By many, farming was viewed as an alternative endeavor to an urban business. Another modern historian opines that more often it was the urban merchant of Carthage who owned rural farming land to some profit, and also to retire there during the heat of summer. It may seem that Mago anticipated such an opinion, and instead issued this contrary advice as quoted by the Roman writer Columella. The man who acquires an estate must sell his house, lest he prefer to live in the town rather than in the country. Anyone who prefers to live in a town has no need of an estate in the country. One who has bought land should sell his town house, so that he will have no desire to worship the household gods of the city rather than those of the country. The man who takes greater delight in his city residence will have no need of a country estate. The issues involved in rural land management also reveal underlying features of Punic society, its structure and stratification. The hired workers might be considered rural proletariat, drawn from the local Berbers. Whether or not there remained Berber landowners next to Punic-run farms is unclear. Some Berbers became sharecroppers. Slaves acquired for farm work were often prisoners of war. In lands outside Punic political control, independent Berbers cultivated grain and raised horses on their lands. Yet within the Punic domain that surrounded the city-state of Carthage, there were ethnic divisions in addition to the usual quasi-feudal distinctions between lord and peasant, or master and serf. This inherent instability in the countryside drew the unwanted attention of potential invaders. Yet for long periods Carthage was able to manage these social difficulties, the many amphorae with Punic markings subsequently found about ancient Mediterranean coastal settlements testify to Carthaginian trade in locally made olive oil and wine. Carthage's agricultural production was held in high regard by the ancients, and rivaled that of Rome. They were once competitors, e.g., over their olive harvests. 
Under Roman rule, however, grain production wheat and barley for export increased dramatically in Africa, yet these later fell with the rise in Roman Egypt's grain exports. Thereafter olive groves and vineyards were re-established around Carthage. Visitors to the several growing regions that surrounded the city wrote admiringly of the lush green gardens, orchards, fields, irrigation channels, hedgerows as boundaries, as well as the many prosperous farming towns located across the rural landscape. Accordingly, the Greek author and compiler Diodorus Siculus, Florida, 1st century BCE, who enjoyed access to ancient writings later lost, and on which he based most of his writings, described agricultural land near the city of Carthage circa 310 BC. It was divided into market gardens and orchards of all sorts of fruit trees, with many streams of water flowing in channels irrigating every part. There were country homes everywhere, lavishly built and covered with stucco. Part of the land was planted with vines, part with olives and other productive trees. Beyond these, cattle and sheep were pastured on the plains, and there were meadows with grazing horses. The Kora farm lands of Carthage encompassed a limited area, the north coastal tell, the lower Bagratas River Valley inland from Utica, Cape Bon, and the adjacent Sahel on the east coast. Punic culture here achieved the introduction of agricultural sciences first developed for lands of the eastern Mediterranean, and their adaptation to local African conditions. The urban landscape of Carthage is known in part from ancient authors, augmented by modern digs and surveys conducted by archaeologists. The first urban nucleus", dating to the 7th century, in area about 10 hectares 25 acres, was apparently located on low-lying lands along the coast north of the later harbours. As confirmed by archaeological excavations, Carthage was a «creation ex nihilo» built on «Virgin land», and situated at what was then the end of a peninsula. Here among «mud brick walls and beaten clay floors» Recently uncovered were also found extensive cemeteries, which yielded evocative grave goods like clay masks. Thanks to this burial archaeology we know more about archaic Carthage than about any other contemporary city in the western Mediterranean. Already in the 8th century, fabric dyeing operations had been established, evident from crushed shells of murex from which the Phoenician purple was derived. Nonetheless, only a meager picture. Of the cultural life of the earliest pioneers in the city can be conjectured, and not much about housing, monuments or defences. The Roman poet Virgil 70 BC imagined early Carthage, when his legendary character Aeneas had arrived there. Aeneas found, where lately huts had been, marvellous buildings, gateways, cobbled ways, and din of wagons. There the Tyrians were hard at work, laying courses for walls. Rolling up stones to build the citadel, while others picked out building sites and ploughed a boundary furrow. Laws were being enacted, magistrates and a sacred senate chosen. Here men were dredging harbours, there they laid the deep foundations of a theatre and quarried massive pillars. The two inner harbours called in Punic Kothon were located in the southeast, one being commercial, and the other for war. Their definite functions are not entirely known, probably for the construction, outfitting, or repair of ships, perhaps also loading and unloading cargo. Larger anchorages existed to the north and south of the city. North and west of the Kothon were located several industrial areas, e.g., metalworking and pottery e.g., for amphora, which could serve both inner harbours, and ships anchored to the south of the city, about the Burza, the citadel area to the north, considering its importance our knowledge of it is patchy. Its prominent heights were the scene of fierce combat during the fiery destruction of the city in 146 BC. The Burza was the reported site of the Temple of Eshman, the healing god, at the top of a stairway of 60 steps. A temple of Tanit, the city's queen goddess, was likely situated on the slope of the Lesser Burza immediately to the east, which runs down toward the sea. Also situated on the Burza were luxury homes, south of the citadel, near the Kothon the inner harbors, was the Tophet, a special and very old cemetery, which when begun lay outside the city's boundaries. Here the Salambo was located, the sanctuary of Tanit, not a temple but an enclosure for placing stone stelae. These were mostly short and upright, carved for funeral purposes. The presence of infant skeletons from here may indicate the occurrence of child sacrifice, as claimed in the Bible, although there has been considerable doubt among archaeologists as to this interpretation and many consider it simply a cemetery devoted to infants. Probably the Tophet burial fields were 
dedicated at an early date, perhaps by the first settlers. Recent studies, on the other hand, indicate that child sacrifice was practiced by the Carthaginians. Between the sea filled Kothon for shipping and the Burza Heights lay the Agora, Greek market, the city state's central marketplace for business and commerce. The Agora was also an area of public squares and plazas, where the people might formally assemble, or gather for festivals. It was the site of religious shrines, and the location of whatever were the major municipal buildings of Carthage. Here beat the heart of civic life. In this district of the Carthage, more probably, the ruling Cephas presided, the Council of Elders convened, the Tribunal of the 104 met, and justice was dispensed at trials in the open air, early residential districts wrapped around the Burza from the south to the northeast. Houses usually were whitewashed and blank to the street, but within were courtyards open to the sky. In these neighborhoods multi-story construction later became common, some up to six stories tall according to an ancient Greek author. Several architectural floor plans of homes have been revealed by recent excavations, as well as the general layout of several city blocks. Stone stairs were set in the streets, and drainage was planned, e.g., in the form of soakways leaching into the sandy soil. Along the Bursa's southern slope were located not only fine old homes, but also many of the earliest grave sites, juxtaposed in small areas, interspersed with daily life. Artisan workshops were located in the city at sites north and west of the harbors. The location of three metal workshops implied from iron slag and other vestiges of such activity were found adjacent to the naval and commercial harbours, and another two were further up the hill toward the Burza citadel. Sites of pottery kilns have been identified, between the Agora and the harbours, and further north. Earthenware often used Greek models. A fuller's shop for preparing woolen cloth shrink and thicken was evidently situated further to the west and south, than by the edge of the city. Carthage also produced objects of rare refinement. During the 4th and 3rd centuries, the sculptures of the sarcophagi became works of art. Bronze engraving and stone carving reached their zenith. The elevation of the land at the promontory on the seashore to the northeast now called Sidi Bo Said, was twice as high above sea level as that at the Burza 100 meters and 50 meters. In between runs a ridge, several times reaching 50 meters, it continues northwestward along the seashore, and forms the edge of a plateau-like area between the Burza and the sea. Newer urban developments lay here in these northern districts, surrounding Carthage were walls of great strength, set in places to rise above 13 meters, being nearly 10 meters thick, according to ancient authors. To the west, three parallel walls were built. The walls altogether ran for about 33 kilometers 21 miles to encircle the city. The heights of the Burza were additionally fortified, this area being the last to succumb to the Romans in 146 BC. Originally the Romans had landed their army on the strip of land extending southward from the city. <laughs> Ancient history Greek cities contested with Carthage for the western Mediterranean culminating in the Sicilian Wars and the Pyrrhic War over Sicily, while the Romans fought three wars against Carthage, known as the Punic Wars. Punic, meaning Phoenician, in Latin. <laughs> Punic Republic The Carthaginian Republic was one of the longest lived and largest states in the ancient Mediterranean. Reports relay several wars with Syracuse and finally, Rome, which eventually resulted in the defeat and destruction of Carthage in the Third Punic War. The Carthaginians were Phoenician settlers originating in the Mediterranean coast of the Near East. They spoke Canaanite, a Semitic language, and followed a local variety of the ancient Canaanite religion. The fall of Carthage came at the end of the Third Punic War in 146 BC at the Battle of Carthage. Despite initial devastating Roman naval losses and Rome's recovery from the brink of defeat after the terror of a 15-year occupation of much of Italy by Hannibal, the end of the series of wars resulted in the end of Carthaginian power and the complete destruction of the city by Scipio Aemilianus. The Romans pulled the Phoenician warships out into the harbour and burned them before the city, and went from house to house, capturing and enslaving the people. About 50,000 Carthaginians were sold into slavery. The city was set ablaze and razed to the ground, leaving only ruins and rubble. 
After the fall of Carthage, Rome annexed the majority of the Carthaginian colonies, including other North African locations such as Volubilis, Lixus, Cella, and Mogador. The legend that the city was sown with salt remains widely accepted despite a lack of evidence among ancient historical accounts. According to R. T. Ridley, the earliest such claim is attributable to B. L. Hallward's chapter in Cambridge Ancient History, published in 1930. Ridley contended that Hallward's claim may have gained traction due to historical evidence of other salted earth instances such as Abimelech's salting of Shechem in Judges chapter 9 verse 45. B. H. Warmington admitted he had repeated Hallward's error, but posited that the legend precedes 1930 and inspired repetitions of the practice. He also suggested that it is useful to understand how subsequent historical narratives have been framed and that the symbolic value of the legend is so great and enduring that it mitigates a deficiency of concrete evidence. Starting in the 19th century, various texts claim that after defeating the city of Carthage in the Third Punic War, 146 BC, the Roman general Scipio Aemilianus Africanus ordered the city be sacked, forced its surviving inhabitants into slavery, plowed it over, and sowed it with salt. However, no ancient sources exist documenting the salting itself. The element of salting is therefore probably a later invention modeled on the biblical story of Shechem. The ritual of symbolically drawing a plow over the site of a city is mentioned in ancient sources, but not in reference to Carthage specifically. When Pope Boniface VIII destroyed Palestrina in 1299, he issued a papal bull that it be plowed, following the old example of Carthage in Africa, and also salted. I have run the plow over it, like the ancient Carthage of Africa, and I have had salt sown upon it. <inaudible> Roman Carthage When Carthage fell, its nearby rival Utica, a Roman ally, was made capital of the region and replaced Carthage as the leading centre of Punic trade and leadership. It had the advantageous position of being situated on the outlet of the Medjerda River, Tunisia's only river that flowed all year long. However, grain cultivation in the Tunisian mountains caused large amounts of silt to erode into the river. This silt accumulated in the harbour until it became useless, and Rome was forced to rebuild Carthage. By 122 BC, Gaius Gracchus founded a short-lived colony, called Colonia Iunonia, after the Latin name for the Punic goddess Tanit, Iuno Calistus. The purpose was to obtain arable lands for impoverished farmers. The Senate abolished the colony some time later, to undermine Gracchus' power. After this ill-fated attempt, a new city of Carthage was built on the same land by Julius Caesar in the period from 49 to 44 BC, and by the first century, it had grown to be the second largest city in the western half of the Roman Empire, with a peak population of 500,000. It was the center of the province of Africa, which was a major breadbasket of the empire. Among its major monuments was an amphitheater. Carthage also became a center of early Christianity see Carthage, Episcopal C. In the first of a string of rather poorly reported councils at Carthage a few years later, no fewer than 70 bishops attended. Tertullian later broke with the mainstream that was increasingly represented in the West by the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, but a more serious rift among Christians was the Donatist controversy, which Augustine of Hippo spent much time and parchment arguing against. At the Council of Carthage 397, the biblical canon for the Western Church was confirmed. The political fallout from the deep disaffection of African Christians is supposedly a crucial factor in the ease with which Carthage and the other centers were captured in the 5th century by Gaiseric, king of the Vandals, who defeated the Roman general Bonifacius and made the city the capital of the Vandal kingdom. Gaiseric was considered a heretic, too, an Arian, and though Arians commonly despised Catholic Christians, a mere promise of toleration might have caused the city's population to accept him. After a failed attempt to recapture the city in the 5th century, the Eastern Roman Empire finally subdued the Vandals in the Vandalic War in 533-534. Thereafter, the city became the seat of the Praetorian Prefecture of Africa, which was made into an exarchate during the Emperor Maurice's reign, as was Ravenna on the Italian peninsula. These two exarchates were the western bulwarks of the Byzantine Empire, all that remained of its power in the west. In the early 7th century Heraclius the Elder, the exarch of Carthage, overthrew the Byzantine emperor Phocas, whereupon his son Heraclius succeeded to the imperial throne. <laughs> Islamic period 
The Roman Exarchate of Africa was not able to withstand the 7th century Muslim conquest of the Maghreb. The Umayyad Caliphate under Abd al Malik ibn Marwan in 686 sent a force led by Zuhair ibn Qais, who won a battle over the Romans and Berbers led by King Kusela of the Kingdom of Altava on the plain of Kairawan, but he could not follow that up. In 695, Hassan ibn al Numan captured Carthage and advanced into the Atlas Mountains. An imperial fleet arrived and retook Carthage, but in 698, Hassan ibn al Numan returned and defeated Emperor Tiberios III at the 698 Battle of Carthage. Roman imperial forces withdrew from all of Africa except Ceuta. Roman Carthage was destroyed its walls torn down, its water supply cut off, and its harbours made unusable. The destruction of the Exarchate of Africa marked a permanent end to the Byzantine Empire's influence in the region. The Medina of Tunis, originally a Berber settlement, was established as the new regional centre under the Umayyad Caliphate in the early 8th century. Under the Aghlabids, the people of Tunis revolted numerous times, but the city profited from economic improvements and quickly became the second most important in the kingdom. It was briefly the national capital, from the end of the reign of Ibrahim II in 902, until 909, when the Shiite Berbers took over Ifriqiya and founded the Fatimid Caliphate. Carthage remained a residential see until the high medieval period, mentioned in two letters of Pope Leo IX dated 1053, written in reply to consultations regarding a conflict between the bishops of Carthage and Gummi. In each of the two letters, Pope Leo declares that, after the Bishop of Rome, the first archbishop and chief metropolitan of the whole of Africa is the Bishop of Carthage. Later, an archbishop of Carthage named Syriacus was imprisoned by the Arab rulers because of an accusation by some Christians. Pope Gregory VII wrote him a letter of consolation, repeating the hopeful assurances of the primacy of the Church of Carthage, whether the Church of Carthage should still lie desolate or rise again in glory. By 1076, Syriacus was set free, but there was only one other bishop in the province. These are the last of whom there is mention in that period of the history of the sea. <inaudible> Modern history Carthage is some 15 kilometres east-northeast of Tunis, the settlements nearest to Carthage were the town of Sidi Bo Said to the north and the village of La Cram to the south. Sidi Bo Saint was a village which had grown around the tomb of the eponymous Sufi Saint, d. 1231, which had been developed into a town under Ottoman rule in the 18th century. Le Cram was developed in the late 19th century under French administration as a settlement close to the port of La Goulette. In 1881, Tunisia became a French protectorate, and in the same year Charles Le Vigery, who was Archbishop of Algiers, became Apostolic Administrator of the Vicariate of Tunis. In the following year, Levigeri became a cardinal. He saw himself as the reviver of the ancient Christian Church of Africa, the Church of Cyprian of Carthage, and, on 10 November 1884, was successful in his great ambition of having the Metropolitan See of Carthage restored, with himself as its first archbishop. In line with the declaration of Pope Leo IX in 1053, Pope Leo XIII acknowledged the revived Archdiocese of Carthage as the primatial see of Africa and Levigeri as primate. The Acropolium of Carthage, St. Louis Cathedral of Carthage, was erected on Burza Hill in 1884. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Archaeological site. The Danish consul Christian Tuxen Falb conducted a first survey of the topography of the archaeological site published in 1833. Antiquarian interest was intensified following the publication of Flaubert's Salambo in 1858. Charles Ernest Bulay performed some preliminary excavations of Roman remains on Burza Hill in 1860. A more systematic survey of both Punic and Roman era remains is due to Alfred Louis de Latre, who was sent to Tunis by Cardinal Charles Levigeri in 1875 on both an apostolic and an archaeological mission. Audalent 1901, p. 203, cites de Latre and Levigeri to the effect that in the 1880s, locals still knew the area of the ancient city under the name of Cartagena i.e. reflecting the Latin and stem Carthagene. Auguste Adalent divides the area of Roman Carthage into four quarters, Cartagena, Dermesh, Burza and La Malga. 
Cartagena and Dermesh correspond with the lower city, including the site of Punic Carthage. Burza is associated with the upper city, which in Punic times was a walled citadel above the harbour, and Lamalga is linked with the more remote parts of the upper city in Roman times. French led excavations at Carthage began in 1921, and from 1923 reported finds of a large quantity of urns containing a mixture of animal and children's bones. René Dassault identified a 4th century BC stella found in Carthage as depicting a child sacrifice, a temple at Amman 1400-1250 BC excavated and reported upon by J.B. Hennessy in 1966, shows the possibility of bestial and human sacrifice by fire. While evidence of child sacrifice in Canaan was the object of academic disagreement, with some scholars arguing that merely children's cemeteries had been unearthed in Carthage, the mixture of children's with animal bones as well as associated epigraphic evidence involving mention of MLK led to a consensus that, at least in Carthage, child sacrifice was indeed common practice. In 2016, an ancient Carthaginian individual, who was excavated from a Punic tomb in Burza Hill, was found to belong to the rare U5B2C1 maternal haplogroup. The young man of Burza specimen dates from the late 6th century BCE, and his lineage is believed to represent early gene flow from Iberia to the Maghreb. Commune <coughs> 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 In 1920, the first seaplane base was built on the Lake of Tunis for the seaplanes of Company A. Aronavale. The Tunis airfield opened in 1938, serving around 5,800 passengers annually on the Paris-Tunis route. During World War II, the airport was used by the United States Army Air Force 12th Air Force as a headquarters and command control base for the Italian Campaign of 1943. Construction on the Tunis Carthage Airport, which was fully funded by France, began in 1944, and in 1948 the airport became the main hub for Tunisair. In the 1950s the Lycée Français de Carthage was established to serve French families in Carthage. In 1961 it was given to the Tunisian government as part of the independence of Tunisia, so the nearby college Maurice Caillou in La Marsa, previously an annex of the Lycée Français de Carthage, was renamed to the Lycée Français de La Marsa and began serving the Lycée level. It is currently the Lycée Gustave Flaubert. After Tunisian independence in 1956, the Tunis conurbation gradually extended around the airport, and Carthage Kraj -Kartaj is now a suburb of Tunis, covering the area between Sidi Bo Said and Le Cram. Its population as of January 2013 was estimated at 21,276, mostly attracting the more wealthy residents. If Carthage is not the capital, it tends to be the political pole, a place of emblematic power according to Sophie Bessis, leaving to Tunis the economic and administrative roles. The Carthage Palace, the Tunisian presidential palace is located in the coast. The suburb has six train stations of the TGM line between La Cram and Sidi Bo Said. Carthage Salambo, named for Salambo, the fictional daughter of Hamilcar, Carthage Burza, named for Burza Hill, Carthage Dermek, Dermesh, Carthage Hannibal, named for Hannibal, Carthage Presidents, named for the Presidential Palace, and Carthage Amilcar, named for Hamilcar. Topic: <laughs> Trade and Business. The merchants of Carthage were in part heirs of the Mediterranean trade developed by Phoenicia, and so also heirs of the rivalry with Greek merchants. Business activity was accordingly both stimulated and challenged. Cyprus had been an early site of such commercial contests. The Phoenicians then had ventured into the western Mediterranean, founding trading posts, including Utica and Carthage. The Greeks followed, entering the western seas where the commercial rivalry continued. Eventually it would lead, especially in Sicily, to several centuries of intermittent war. Although Greek-made merchandise was generally considered superior in design, Carthage also produced trade goods in abundance. That Carthage came to function as a manufacturing colossus was shown during the Third Punic War with Rome. Carthage, which had previously disarmed, then was made to face the fatal Roman siege. The city suddenly organized the manufacture of arms with great skill and effectiveness. According to Strabo 63 BC, AD 21 in his Geographica, Carthage each day produced 140 finished shields, 300 swords, 500 spears, and 1,000 missiles for the catapults. 
Furthermore, Carthage although surrounded by the Romans built 120 decked ships in two months for old timber had been stored away in readiness, and a large number of skilled workmen, maintained at public expense. The textiles industry in Carthage probably started in private homes, but the existence of professional weavers indicates that a sort of factory system later developed. Products included embroidery, carpets, and use of the purple murex dye for which the Carthaginian Isle of Gerba was famous. Metalworkers developed specialized skills, i.e., making various weapons for the armed forces, as well as domestic articles, such as knives, forks, scissors, mirrors, and razors all articles found in tombs. Artwork in metals included vases and lamps in bronze, also bowls, and plates. Other products came from such crafts as the potters, the glassmakers, and the goldsmiths. Inscriptions on votive steel indicate that many were not slaves but free citizens. Phoenician and Punic merchant ventures were often run as a family enterprise, putting to work its members and its subordinate clients. Such family-run businesses might perform a variety of tasks, a own and maintain the ships, providing the captain and crew, b do the negotiations overseas, either by barter or buy and sell, of i their own manufactured commodities and trade goods, and e native products metals, foodstuffs, etc. to carry and trade elsewhere, and c send their agents to stay at distant outposts in order to make lasting local contacts, and later to establish a warehouse of shipped goods for exchange, and eventually perhaps a settlement. Over generations, such activity might result in the creation of a wide-ranging network of trading operations. Ancillary would be the growth of reciprocity between different family firms, foreign and domestic. State protection was extended to its sea traders by the Phoenician city of Tyre and later likewise by the daughter city-state of Carthage. Stéphane Gassel, the well-regarded French historian of ancient North Africa, summarized the major principles guiding the civic rulers of Carthage with regard to its policies for trade and commerce. 1. To open and maintain markets for its merchants, whether by entering into direct contact with foreign peoples using either treaty negotiations or naval power, or by providing security for isolated trading stations. 2. The reservation of markets exclusively for the merchants of Carthage, or where competition could not be eliminated, to regulate trade by state-sponsored agreements with its commercial rivals. 3. Suppression of piracy, and promotion of Carthage's ability to freely navigate the seas. Both the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians were well known in antiquity for their secrecy in general, and especially pertaining to commercial contacts and trade routes. Both cultures excelled in commercial dealings. Strabo 63 BC AD 21, the Greek geographer wrote that before its fall in 146 BC, Carthage enjoyed a population of 700,000, and directed an alliance of 300 cities. The Greek historian Polybius c. referred to Carthage as the wealthiest city in the world. <laughs> Constitution of state A. Safay, possibly two, was elected by the citizens, and held office with no military power for a one-year term. Carthaginian generals marshaled mercenary armies and were separately elected. From about 550 to 450 the Maganid family monopolized the top military position, later the Barsid family acted similarly. Eventually it came to be that, after a war, the commanding general had to testify justifying his actions before a court of 104 judges. Aristotle 384-322 discusses Carthage in his work, Politica, he begins, The Carthaginians are also considered to have an excellent form of government. He briefly describes the city as a mixed constitution, a political arrangement with cohabiting elements of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, i.e., a king GK, Basilis, a council of elders GK, Garusha, and the people GK, Demos. Later Polybius of Megalopolis c. Greek in his histories would describe the Roman Republic in more detail as a mixed constitution in which the consuls were the monarchy, the senate the aristocracy, and the assemblies the democracy. Evidently Carthage also had an institution of elders who advised the Cephas, similar to a Greek Gerusha or the Roman Senate. We do not have a Punic name for this body. At times its members would travel with an army general on campaign. Members also formed permanent committees. 
The institution had several hundred members drawn from the wealthiest class who held office for life. Vacancies were probably filled by recruitment from among the elite, i.e., by co-option. From among its members were selected the 104 judges mentioned above. Later the 104 would come to evaluate not only army generals but other office holders as well. Aristotle regarded the 104 as most important, he compared it to the Ephorate of Sparta with regard to control over security. In Hannibal's time, such a judge held office for life. At some stage there also came to be independent self-perpetuating boards of five who filled vacancies and supervised non-military government administration. Popular assemblies also existed at Carthage. When deadlocked the Cephes and the quasi-senatorial institution of elders might request the assembly to vote, also, assembly votes were requested in very crucial matters in order to achieve political consensus and popular coherence. The assembly members had no legal wealth or birth qualification. How its members were selected is unknown, e.g., whether by festival group or urban ward or another method. The Greeks were favorably impressed by the constitution of Carthage. Aristotle had a separate study of it made, which unfortunately is lost. In his Politica, he states, The government of Carthage is oligarchical, but they successfully escaped the evils of oligarchy by enriching one portion of the people after another by sending them to their colonies. T air policy is to send some poorer citizens to their dependent towns, where they grow rich." Yet Aristotle continues, I if any misfortune occurred, and the bulk of the subjects revolted, there would be no way of restoring peace by legal means." Aristotle remarked also, Many of the Carthaginian institutions are excellent. The superiority of their constitution is proved by the fact that the common people remain loyal to the constitution. The Carthaginians have never had any rebellion worth speaking of, and have never been under the rule of a tyrant. Here one may remember that the city state of Carthage, whose citizens were mainly Libby Phoenicians of Phoenician ancestry born in Africa, dominated and exploited an agricultural countryside composed mainly of native Berber sharecroppers and farmworkers, whose affiliations to Carthage were open to divergent possibilities. Beyond these more settled Berbers and the Punic farming towns and rural manors, lived the independent Berber tribes, who were mostly pastoralists. In the brief, uneven review of government at Carthage found in his Politica Aristotle mentions several faults. Thus, that the same person should hold many offices, which is a favorite practice among the Carthaginians. Aristotle disapproves, mentioning the flute player and the shoemaker. Also, that Magistrates should be chosen not only for their merit but for their wealth. Aristotle's opinion is that focus on pursuit of wealth will lead to oligarchy and its evils. S. Yearly it is a bad thing that the greatest offices should be bought. The law which allows this abuse makes wealth of more account than virtue, and the whole state becomes avaricious. For, whenever the chiefs of the state deem anything honorable, the other citizens are sure to follow their example, and, where virtue has not the first place, their aristocracy cannot be firmly established." In Carthage the people seemed politically satisfied and submissive, according to the historian Warmington. They and their assemblies only rarely exercised the few opportunities given them to assent to state decisions. Popular influence over government appears not to have been an issue at Carthage. Being a commercial republic fielding a mercenary army, the people were not conscripted for military service, an experience which can foster the feel for popular political action. But perhaps this misunderstands the society, perhaps the people, whose values were based on small group loyalty, felt themselves sufficiently connected to their city's leadership by the very integrity of the person-to-person -person linkage within their social fabric. Carthage was very stable, there were few openings for tyrants. Only after defeat by Rome devastated Punic imperial ambitions did the people of Carthage seem to question their governance and to show interest in political reform. In 196, following the Second Punic War 218-201, Hannibal Barca, still greatly admired as a Barsid military leader, was elected Safe. When his reforms were blocked by a financial official about to become a judge for life, Hannibal rallied the populace against the 104 judges. He proposed a one-year term for the 104, as part of a major civic overhaul. Additionally, the reform included a restructuring of the city's revenues, and the fostering of trade and agriculture. The changes rather quickly resulted in a noticeable increase in prosperity. 
Yet his incorrigible political opponents cravenly went to Rome, to charge Hannibal with conspiracy, namely, plotting war against Rome in league with Antiochus the Hellenic ruler of Syria. Although the Roman Scipio Africanus resisted such maneuver, eventually intervention by Rome forced Hannibal to leave Carthage. Thus, corrupt city officials efficiently blocked Hannibal Barca in his efforts to reform the government of Carthage. Mago 6th century was king of Carthage, the head of state, war leader, and religious figurehead. His family was considered to possess a sacred quality. Mago's office was somewhat similar to that of a pharaoh, but although kept in a family it was not hereditary, it was limited by legal consent. Picard, accordingly, believes that the Council of Elders and the Popular Assembly are late institutions. Carthage was founded by the King of Tyre who had a royal monopoly on this trading venture. Thus it was the royal authority stemming from this traditional source of power that the King of Carthage possessed. Later, as other Phoenician ship companies entered the trading region, and so associated with the city-state, the King of Carthage had to keep order among a rich variety of powerful merchants in their negotiations among themselves and over risky commerce across the Mediterranean. Under these circumstances, the office of king began to be transformed. Yet it was not until the aristocrats of Carthage became wealthy owners of agricultural lands in Africa that a council of elders was institutionalized at Carthage. Contemporary sources Most ancient literature concerning Carthage comes from Greek and Roman sources as Carthage's own documents were destroyed by the Romans. Apart from inscriptions, hardly any Punic literature has survived, and none in its own language and script. A brief catalogue would include Three short treaties with Rome Latin translations Several pages of Hanno the Navigator's log book concerning his 5th century maritime exploration of the Atlantic coast of West Africa Greek translation. Fragments quoted from Mago's 4th, 3rd century 28-volume treatise on agriculture Latin translations. The Roman playwright Plautus c. in his Ponilus incorporates a few fictional speeches delivered in Punic, whose written lines are transcribed into Latin letters phonetically. The thousands of inscriptions made in Punic script, thousands, but many extremely short, e.g., a dedication to a deity with the personal names of the devotees. F. Rom the Greek author Plutarch c. 46 c. 120 we learn of the sacred books in Punic safeguarded by the city's temples. Few Punic texts survive, however. Once. The city archives, the annals, and the scribal lists of Cephas existed, but evidently these were destroyed in the horrific fires during the Roman capture of the city in 146 BC yet some Punic books Latin, Libri Punici from the libraries of Carthage reportedly did survive the fires. These works were apparently given by Roman authorities to the newly augmented Berber rulers. Over a century after the fall of Carthage, the Roman politician turned author Gaius Salistius Crispus or Sallust 86 to 34 reported his having seen volumes written in Punic, which books were said to be once possessed by the Berber king, Hemsal II, R 88 to 81. By way of Berber informants and Punic translators, Sallust had used these surviving books to write his brief sketch of Berber affairs. Probably some of Hemsal II's Libri Punici, that had escaped the fires that consumed Carthage in 146 BC, wound up later in the large royal library of his grandson Juba II, R.25 BC AD 24. Juba II not only was a Berber king, and husband of Cleopatra's daughter, but also a scholar and author in Greek of no less than nine works. He wrote for the Mediterranean-wide audience then enjoying classical literature. The Libri Punici inherited from his grandfather surely became useful to him when composing his Libica, a work on North Africa written in Greek. Unfortunately, only fragments of Libica survive, mostly from quotations made by other ancient authors. It may have been Juba II who discovered the five centuries old log book of Hanno the Navigator, called the Periplus, among library documents saved from fallen Carthage. In the end, however, most Punic writings that survived the destruction of Carthage did not escape the immense wreckage in which so many of antiquity's literary works perished." Accordingly, the long and continuous interactions between Punic citizens of Carthage and the Berber communities that surrounded the city have no local historian. 
their political arrangements and periodic crises, their economic and work life, the cultural ties and social relations established and nourished infrequently as kin, are not known to us directly from ancient Punic authors in written accounts. Neither side has left us their stories about life in Punic era Carthage. Regarding Phoenician writings, few remain and these seldom refer to Carthage. The more ancient and most informative are cuneiform tablets, ca. 1600–1185, from ancient Ugarit, located to the north of Phoenicia on the Syrian coast, it was a Canaanite city politically affiliated with the Hittites. The clay tablets tell of myths, epics, rituals, medical and administrative matters, and also correspondence. The highly valued works of Sanchuniathon, an ancient priest of Beirut, who reportedly wrote on Phoenician religion and the origins of civilization, are themselves completely lost, but some little content endures twice removed. Sanchuniathon was said to have lived in the 11th century, which is considered doubtful. Much later a Phoenician history by Philo of Byblos reportedly existed, written in Greek, but only fragments of this work survive. An explanation proffered for why so few Phoenician works endured, early on 11th century archives and records began to be kept on papyrus, which does not long survive in a moist coastal climate. Also, both Phoenicians and Carthaginians were well known for their secrecy, thus, of their ancient writings we have little of major interest left to us by Carthage, or by Phoenicia the country of origin of the city founders. Of the various Phoenician and Punic compositions alluded to by the ancient classical authors, not a single work or even fragment has survived in its original idiom. Indeed, not a single Phoenician manuscript has survived in the original language or in translation. We cannot therefore access directly the line of thought or the contour of their worldview as expressed in their own words, in their own voice. Ironically, it was the Phoenicians who invented or at least perfected and transmitted a form of writing the alphabet that has influenced dozens of cultures including our own. As noted, the celebrated ancient books on agriculture written by Mago of Carthage survives only via quotations in Latin from several later Roman works. <laughs> 